The Tragic Deception of Marsock Fox Company Ever wonder what it feels like to be betrayed by the same country you swore to protect? Well, no one knows this feeling better than the seven members of the Marsock Fox Unit who were labeled as war criminals for a crime they never committed. The brave men fought to defend themselves, but had to go through years of interrogation and public ridicule to prove their innocence. Today, we will dive into the story of the tragic deception and betrayal of Marsock Fox Company. Marsock, short for Marine Corps Forces Special Operations Command, is an elite unit that carries out highly sensitive missions for the Marine Corps and U.S. Special Operations Command. Their training and capabilities rival those of famous groups like Navy SEALs and Army Special Forces. However, despite intensive preparation for high-risk operations, MARSOC units, like other Special Forces units, can still encounter several difficulties during complex battlefield missions. One MARSOC company, known as Fox Company, faced a crisis that damaged their reputations despite years of distinguished service. On March 4, 2007, at exactly 6 a.m., a team from Fox Company departed their base in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Their operation took them through Nangahar province near the mountainous Pakistan border, a Taliban stronghold at the time. Before we continue, take a moment to like the video, subscribe to this channel, and turn on the notification bell to get notified anytime we post amazing videos like this. All right, back to the video. The Fox Company team was on a mission to gather intelligence and connect with local leaders who were in support of the U.S.-backed Afghan government. Their three-phase operation had been approved by senior commanders. The first phase involved reconnaissance around the Tora Bora Mountains near the Pakistan border to find insurgent points for future patrols. The Fox Company convoy, led by Commander Fred Galvin, headed east from Jalalabad through the town of Barikau. The route took them through small villages surrounded by cornfields and past mud brick houses as they approached the towering Tora Bora Mountains. The roads grew more treacherous, with deep pits and craters from years of conflict. The team, briefly coordinated with an Army military police unit, posted near the border for continuing their journey. However, Recent heavy snows meant they struggled to find usable mountain passes for setting up future observation posts. After several fruitless hours of searching, the mission continued to the next phase. After failing to locate any viable insurgent points in the mountains, the Fox Company convoy headed back westward toward the village of Barikau. This area was known as a Taliban staging ground for attacks on U.S. and Afghan government forces. For the mission's second phase, the Marines planned to meet with local tribal elders to gather intelligence on Taliban operations in the district. As the Humvees entered the outskirts of Barikau, the busy market streets abruptly became strangely quiet. The only visible people were men of fighting age lurking in the doorways of shuttered shops. The Marines suddenly realized they had entered an ambush zone. Before they could move further, a vehicle rammed into the vehicle directly behind the lead vehicle, causing a huge explosion that sent flames and shrapnel flying in every direction. The deafening blast engulfed the road in flames, with smoke obstructing the view of the chaotic kill zone. Powerful explosion of the suicide vehicle reverberated through the streets, destroying one Humvee while the platoon scrambled to escape the ambush. The Marines poured rifle and machine gun fire in the direction of the blast while maneuvering their remaining vehicles to break contact. With smoke obscuring the kill zone, they fought to suppress small arms attacks erupting from the surrounding buildings in order to punch through the complex ambush. Just as they were about to escape, a mob appeared in front with barricades. The turret gunner, who was briefly caught in flames from the explosion, fired warning shots toward a mob of angry villagers blocking the only exit road, forcing them to disperse. This allowed the battered Fox Company team to hastily withdraw back toward the Jalalabad base, having sustained only one Marine wounded by shrapnel. However, the Marzak Fox team, despite just escaping a near-death experience, never knew that what awaited them at the base was far worse than the ambush they'd just survived. As the Fox Company convoy raced back to Jalalabad Airfield after surviving an ambush, 
Commander Fred Galvin soon realized the already dire situation was continuing to spiral out of their control. Enraged villagers were spreading inflammatory misinformation and false accusations before the battered platoon had even reached safety. Elders from Barikau traveled to Jalalabad and told outrageous lies, claiming the Marzak troops had gone door-to-door, -door firing indiscriminately at civilians. They provided bogus, emotional accounts of Marines bursting into homes and massacring women and children in a deranged rampage. Local journalists then amplified these fraudulent reports of a methodical massacre. In truth, as later investigations definitely confirmed, the Fox Company Marines had immediately departed Barikau following the explosion and shooting without causing any civilian casualties. However, the Taliban saw an opportunity to score a propaganda win after failing to destroy the Marzak patrol on the battlefield. The insurgents cynically coached village leaders to level false murder allegations for financial and political gain. Colonel Nicholson, the Army commander overseeing counterinsurgency efforts in Nangahar province, credulously accepted these allegations despite doubts. Eager to placate angry Afghans, Nicholas apologized publicly for Marsak's alleged actions only a day after the ambush. The Pentagon then took the remarkable steps of compensating so-called victims of the fictitious massacre based solely on the groundless claims parroted by columnists and politicians. Meanwhile, Commander Fred Gelman desperately tried to convey that his men acted how they were trained to while under fire from all directions, but few decision makers in Kabul or Washington, D.C. were willing to listen. The rumor spread by the Taliban in the aftermath of the ambush continued to spiral. General Frank Kearney, commander of special operations for the Central Command, told the Washington Post without evidence that Fox Company had massacred at least 15 civilians. His statements, which lent credence to Taliban propaganda, shocked the members of the unit who knew that all these allegations were false. However, General Kearney doubled down on buying into the smear campaign. He falsely claimed Marsoc troops had abandoned vehicles during the engagement when in reality, they had maintained good order under fire. Kearney also erroneously stated that there were no indications Fox Company faced any incoming small arms fire during the battle, betraying a stunning ignorance of the confirmed ambush. For Captain Vince Noble and other members of the team present that day, hearing a general perpetuate lies was devastating after their harrowing experience. The loads of false allegations took a toll on the members of the Fox Company in the weeks following the ambush. Fred Gelman, the unit's commander, worked tirelessly to refute each rumor and clarify events, but found few who would listen amongst the brass. Instead, senior officers seemed intent on pacifying critics by throwing Gelman's team under the bus without cause. Barely a month after the battle, the command staff delivered orders for Fox Company to immediately depart Afghanistan in disgrace. As soon as their plane took off from Bagram Air Base, Galvin knew the quest to salvage his men's reputation would be a long, grueling fight against powerful interest. Upon returning to the U.S., Fred Galvin and the members of the Marsoc Fox Company hoped top officials would realize the allegations of massacring civilians were vicious lies concocted in a Taliban disinformation plot. However, instead of reaching that understanding, the Marine Corps shocked Galvin and his men in January 2008 by announcing a court of inquiry on the incident. The purpose of the legal proceedings was to determine if sufficient evidence warranted bringing criminal charges against the unit's members. Finnets included Galvin and six other central members of Fox Company on the March 4th mission. For three intense weeks, the Marine defendants described the ambush and aftermath before prosecutors hell-bent on proving they were war criminals. Much testimony addressed while firing had been fully justified and how Taliban fighters had lured the patrol into a meticulously planned trap. The inquiry reviewed classified intelligence reports that corroborated ambush casualties among Taliban bombers and gunmen suppressed by the Fox Company. Grueling cross-examinations by military lawyers took a severe toll on the members of the unit, already battling trauma from the whole ordeal. Grueling cross-examinations by military lawyers took a severe toll on the members of the unit, already battling trauma from the whole ordeal. 
Fred Gelman felt devastated observing his men, some of the Corps' best, being subjected to the humiliation of defending their actions under friendly fire from the same country they had sworn to protect. The legal purgatory only intensified for Fox Company after the Court of Inquiry adjourned. Fred Gelman and his men waited anxiously for months without any communication on the verdict. During the uncertain interim, media coverage portrayed the unit as rogue war criminals who gunned down innocent civilians in a callous rampage. Finally, in late May, Naval Command in Quantico revealed that no criminal charges would be filed. However, the Corps refused request to ensure a more forceful public statement exonerating Fox Company. So while legally in the clear, the members returned to their home base still under a cloud of suspicion. And the unit, faith in leadership was lost after the way both Marines and Army generals had turned on them without evidence. Some Corps leaders continued making bad comments about the incident, further eroding trust. Fred Galvin grew incensed, observing the psychological toll on his team. One squad leader named Hector revealed he hesitated to ever use force again because it's easier to take a bullet than undergo more investigations. Another member of the team who spoke up said, the world sees me as a war criminal, even if I'm innocent. Determined to counteract this destructive mindset, Galvin spent years appealing to all levels of military and civilian officials to clearly acknowledge his Marines' innocence. Sympathetic legislators like Congressman Walter Jones waged their own efforts to prompt an Inspector General inquiry into the corrupt handling of the allegations. While Galvin found few leaders willing to defend Fox Company, most officials proved unwilling to revisit the messy case. Without an emotionally resonant public offense, the members largely lingered under the stigma of suspected war criminals. A decade on from the ambush, Fred Galvin continued his tireless crusade to overturn the narrative that his Fox Company Marines had perpetrated an unprovoked massacre of civilians. Support finally emerged in 2018 when a Navy Review Board thoroughly re-examined available evidence and issued a strong determination that the unit responded properly on March 4, 2007. While a welcome vindication, the years of stigma had taken a steep toll personally and professionally for many of those involved. Several unit members developed severe anxiety, which officers attributed to the repeated investigations and public condemnation. Their careers were also stalled. The once respected soldiers were suddenly denied promotions because of perceived dirt in their service records. Captain Vince Noble described lingering impact saying, it's harder and harder to wear the uniform when I feel like the institution I love still views me as a criminal. Fred Gelman echoed feeling betrayed by commanders after what men risk in combat, abandoning them to placard critics is utterly shameful. In retirement, General Frank Kearney, who led JSOC in 2007, voiced regrets about accepting initial civilian death reports from Army officers rather than properly verifying them. But for congressmen like Walter Jones, such admissions came too little too late after years of injustice already inflicted on the members of Marsoc Fox. The Marsoc Fox team are indeed men of valor, but their story just shows how anyone can be betrayed by the same people they risk their lives to protect. If not for the tireless effort of their commander, Fred Galvin, the team would have been thrown under the bus even without evidence. What is your opinion on this incident? Feel free to drop your answers in the comments.